as is customary in Australia nowadays, uh, and as a sign of respect, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I work and live, the Turbal and Jagera people. I recognise and respect their ongoing connection to the land and water, their cultural and spiritual practices, and to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to acknowledge and pay respects to the elders and members of any other Indigenous communities who may be joining us today, including those from overseas. For those that have joined us in our previous webinars, you'll be familiar with these names, but I would like to, for any newcomers, and just to repeat the uh, ethos of the team effort that we've been undertaking this activity, the Casa Verde Ports team are here with me today. My name is Dan Parsons. I'm the Senior Standards Officer in the Flight Safety Branch. Uh, with us, uh, Mr. Joe Hain, who's the Team Leader for Future Aerodromes, and Mr. Liam Smith, our VertiPort specialist. Also on the line today, we have our colleagues from the Stakeholder Engagement Division. They've helped us pull together this webinar series and help out with any questions. Speaking of which, since I've been the go-to guy to be answering questions both during the presentation and the Q&A session, uh, but I'm somewhat distracted today, of course, we'll be keeping the chat function closed until the Q&A session at the end but I thoroughly encourage you to jot down any questions you have as we go and get ready to put them into the chat function when we near the end of the presentation. I wanted to let you know that we do use all of these questions, whether we respond to them or not, as part of the feedback associated with this consultation program, but we do encourage everybody to submit more formal feedback through our consultation hub, and I'll have details on that process at the end of the presentation. And one final notice before we get into today's topic, if you have missed any of the previous webinars, you can use this QR code. It will take you straight to our playlist on YouTube. It's got all our greatest hits, webinar one and two, and eventually it will include this webinar and our final webinar in the series coming up in two weeks. If you don't have a QR code reader, that's okay. It's pretty easy. Go to youtube.com search for CASA Briefing, one word, and on the CASA Briefing channel at the moment, where the most recent two videos, and you can also access our playlist there. Getting on to today's topic, what are we talking about? The overall title is Obstacle Limitation Surfaces, and that is a well-established, enormous concept associated with conventional aerodromes and heliports as well. If you are familiar with obstacle limitation surfaces, that's great. You're going to get a little bit of a head start, but you also might have a little bit of a disadvantage because some of the particulars associated with the OLS that we're going to talk about today are different. We have taken a slightly different approach for a variety of reasons, which we'll get into the rationale as well today. And therefore, it's best not to necessarily assume that OLS uh, concepts that exist today are exactly the same in the VertiPort world. OLS is also a big and complex topic area because it not only involves the technical specifications of these imaginary surfaces, but it also includes the procedures associated with maintaining these surfaces, so monitoring them to look for obstacles infringing, whether assessing those hazards, potentially removing them or denying approval to proposed objects. In the aerodrome space, these objects also include people, vehicles and navigation aids. And infringements often trigger marking and lighting requirements and also publishing details in NOTAMs or in URSA. The good news if you're new to this concept or perhaps even if you're familiar with it, is that we're not actually going to deal with any of these procedural aspects here today. Within the context of the advisory circular, we are focusing on the technical specifications because all those other aspects have a lot of open questions associated with them. 
and we want to address those questions in consultation with the industry and with other government stakeholders to make sure that we both integrate with other people's expectations and existing legislation. So today we're going to talk about the technical aspects of a Vertiport OLS. By the end of this presentation, I hope that you'll be able to describe the components of the OLS specifications, uh, outline the rationale behind their design, or at least the rationale I described to you today, and be able to describe some of their key characteristics and parameters. However, I might do a little bait and switch now and suggest that perhaps the topic of today's discussion is more obstacle clearance. While we've kept the OLS title to go with a certain amount of expectation within the advisory circular, at this stage in the process, without all those other procedures, we are talking more about obstacle clearance. And this is a much more important concept, I think, for vertiports than in previous aerodrome discussions. Traditionally speaking with conventional aerodromes, we have established a certain avoidance of obstacles as best we can by putting airports away from built up areas. We'll often select large flat areas, swamps, or in more modern times, reclaiming land from the sea in order to minimize the impact of obstacles in the vicinity of the facility. Verdi Ports is a completely different space. AAM seeks to put these facilities are somewhat in the middle of these obstacle rich environments, which is almost my favorite term associated with vertiports at this stage because of the challenge it presents. Within the scope of this AC and our philosophy, everything has boiled down to, or well, we focused a lot on flight paths as the basis of our obstacle limitation surfaces. And therefore we start to get into this discussion of really establishing a minimum clearance between the aircraft and any potential objects. Our overall design philosophy for these specifications, and you'll recognize a lot of these concepts from our previous discussions, has been first and foremost, we wanted to design simple specifications. We recognize that in the initial stages and perhaps for the life of AAM overall, some vertiports will be very simple facilities. In some parlance, it might be called a verti stop and is analogous to a bus stop. Essentially, a single FATO and a single teal off. The aircraft lands within that space, the passengers get in, get out, and the aircraft departs. So we want to be cognizant of requirements for that type of facility. But then we also wanted to be able to support much more complex vertiport environments, much like you see in the diagram here. And therefore our specifications need to be scalable. We also wanted to achieve a certain amount of outcome based specifications. And whilst in this particular area, maybe that's sometimes difficult to see because of all the technical details and the numbers but we have as much as possible tried to essentially achieve that outcome of obstacle clearance. And then the final piece is to be flexible. Given the wide range of designs we've already seen for Verdi ports and AAM aircraft, we wanted to be able to support that development, that innovation and that diversity through flexible specifications. That flexibility that we see in VTOL capable aircraft is essentially rooted in the flight paths. What we've already seen from OEMs, mainly through videos and animations, is a pretty diverse operating envelope for VTOL capable aircraft. Obviously, we see a lot of vertical procedures, but we've also seen a demonstration of hover like horizontal procedures. I believe a couple of the manufacturers refer to these as virtual runways. When we've conceptualized flight paths to understand the impact and the design of potential flight paths, we've generally put into two categories all of these different concepts. We've got intrinsic factors and we've got extrinsic factors. The intrinsic factors come from the aircraft, both its performance capability, 
established through its power, its weight, its critical failure states, but then also how the operator may wish to operate the aircraft. The capability of the aircraft may not necessarily gel with the usage of the aircraft in terms of power management, range, speed, or even passenger comfort. We don't know these parameters yet. This is the black box that we're trying to deal with to work around. And as data becomes available, we understand it is very sensitive. We'll definitely look at how these intrinsic factors affect our thinking associated with flight paths. We, of course, are dealing with mostly the extrinsic factors. And I've indicated here just four. There are definitely more. We're here today to talk about the obstacle clearance piece. Elsewhere in the advisory circular, we talk about downwash. Noise and privacy are often described in this same conversation, but they will most likely be dealt with other aspects of government regulation. Other parts within CASA, though, we'll be looking at airspace capacity, operational separation, and of course, operational oversight of the aircraft themselves. The moral of this particular story is that we are just one piece of the puzzle. We recognize that. And many of the other pieces, including our own, are just taking shape at this stage. In order to design specifications around the flight paths, though, we have had to make some assumptions. Now, this diagram here is not an OLS. This is actually our assumption of where an aircraft may be during this particular manoeuvre profile. We have considered that the final approach or the initial departure, and sorry, I'm going to talk in a lot of dichotomy between departure and, uh, sorry, departure and arrival. But the initial or final manoeuvre from the FATO could be a vertical manoeuvre. And within our assumptions at this stage, that is a purely vertical maneuver straight up from the FATO. It may commence from a low hover in the case of an air taxi, but it essentially would remain within the FATO overall, bearing in mind that we're going to accommodate a certain amount of drift as the aircraft climbs. There may be following or even initially a horizontal maneuver, and this is the virtual runway concept that I said some manufacturers have perceived already as part of their operation. This is a space where the aircraft will either gain or lose forward momentum. If it's gaining forward momentum, that is no doubt an uh, achievement of a climb out performance requirement. If it's losing it, and so it could achieve a landing or perhaps a vertical procedure. A lot of the aircraft we see using this particular type of flight pattern, a transition between rotor or thr thrust-based lift to wing-based lift. In nearly all cases, we believe that there'll be some form of approach climb out maneuver. This is fairly a traditional approach to achieve a certain amount of height and speed in an economical fashion. It's a combination of horizontal and vertical flight, fairly standard for both rotor-based aircraft and wing-based aircraft. Some of the particular assumptions we have about this flow flight profile is at the outer edge, we consider that to be set by the maximum height of 152 meters above the FATO. So from 500 feet and below, we consider that, let's say, the terminal environment. And this is the bit where we want to consider obstacles. That's within the VertiPort advisory material. Of course, en route obstacle clearance will be dealt with in other specifications. The other aspect of our assumption associated with flight is that the horizontal position of the aircraft will drift around its intended flight path. In vertical flight, that looks like a circle. In horizontal flight, that would tend to be a lateral deviation from the intended flight path. And we have assumed that as the aircraft climbs away from the ground, that because the visual reference for the pilot is increased, that it is harder to maintain that desired position. If you remember from the preamble of this advisory circular, 
we have at this stage assumed a pilot on board operating in visual conditions. Of course, there's a maximum to this. Every pilot goes through a process where they no longer maintain necessarily a visual reference to the ground for positioning purposes. And you can see that reflected in the maximum divergence of the approach climb out area in this particular diagram. In our language, not necessarily a strict assumption, but in our language in the specifications, we have designed each piece to work once and in a particular order. So a vertical flight over the FATO, potentially followed by a horizontal flight, and then finished off with a climb out portion. If more complex flight procedures are envisaged at a later date, we'll definitely have to revisit this language. But if you're trying to construct a particularly complex flight path in the vicinity of a Verdi port, then you might find some of the language cumbersome and we're more than happy to take that feedback either officially or at any point that that uh, flight maneuver requirement becomes uh, a possibility. Let's get into the specifications in particular. When you jump into this particular chapter in the advisory circular, we've got two main discussion areas. The second one are the surfaces or what we've described as the surfaces. And they're your more traditional approach climb out surface and the transitional surfaces. But coming back to the FATO, we've described a range of considerations around the FATO and above the FATO that we've called origins. And we've moved some specifications from other chapters, if you're familiar with, say, Annex 14, Volume 2, to this space because it is so closely tied with the process of building the obstacle limitation surfaces that we wanted to start essentially on the same page. So when you jump into this chapter, we start at the FATO and we work our way out, even though, of course, the aircraft might be arriving through these same surfaces. The first thing I want to note that the word protection area is simply the new name for the FATO safety area. For a variety of reasons associated with learnings in other areas of aviation, we're trying to avoid this broad labeling of something as safety. Everything in our specifications here relate to safety. In this particular space, we're protecting the area around the FATO from excessive objects, hence the name change. We've gone through, again, a building block approach to building these particular origins, and we've introduced concepts or we've put names to concepts such as reference circles and circumscribed squares. This may seem like an unnecessary level of complexity, but again, if we want to be flexible to the variety of flight path alternatives that may exist, then we have to build in a little bit of a way to build upon the basic concepts. Within the origins, we have the three optional surfaces, depending if vertical procedures are used or horizontal procedures are used. And then, like I said, we move into the more traditional description of surfaces, much like our existing OLS for aerodromes and heliports. But let's get into the details. We're going to go through building up the origins of our FATO, oh, sorry, of our OLS. In this particular circumstance, or in these four particular circumstances, we're not dealing with vertical procedures. So this is very much a traditional approach to building the OLS around our aerodrome. The first FATO on the left is fairly stock standard. It would be 1.5 design D in both dimensions. FATO 2, just a different shape, but the overall dimensions would be the same, at least in the full lateral and the full longitudinal portion. FATO 3 there is an elongated FATO, probably designed to allow a certain amount of rejected takeoff area in the aircraft operation requires that for a critical failure before the takeoff decision point. And then the last FATO is just probably unnecessarily complex, but we like to push the boundaries of our specifications and looks to be three elongated FATOs, 
offset by 60 degrees to create this pretty looking play button. I'm not sure if this would ever get used, but again, we like to stress test our standards. On top of the FATO, we need to consider, of course, the flight paths. So here are some flight paths here that we've considered for each FATO. Again, FATO number one, fairly vanilla, diametrically opposed, inbound and outbound, let's say to the north and to the south of this particular FATO. Our second FATO is similar, but they have a sector available both to the north and the south. So there's a range of particular flight paths that a VTOL capable aircraft may approach this Verdi port. The elongated FATO is similar to the first, north, south, in and out flight paths, but they're centered at the extremes of the elongated portion of the FATO. And again, FATO number four, nice and complex, inbound from the southwest, outbound to the northwest, and at least inbound from the east could be outbound as well. But the position of all these FATOs, where they enter or exit, or sorry, all these flight paths, where they enter or exit the FATO environment, these become the centers of our reference circles. For our fairly easy FATOs on the left and right, there's one reference circle, again, centered on the FATO center. But where we're dealing with the more complex environments, you can see we've got two reference circles for FATO number three and three for FATO number four. In these two cases where we've got more than one reference circle, we want to join them up so that we maintain clearance through the whole takeoff or approach maneuver. So we bring in common tangents. These essentially just join up the extremities of the circles to fill out the shape. The last step of this process is to allow us to be able to join other obstacle limitation surfaces to this protection area. So we essentially have to square off these circles. And these are our circumscribed squares. These squares are again aligned with the flight path. So if your eye is already drawn to FATO number two, you can see that having a range of flight paths and a, a, a whole sector available, then this circumscribed square starts to become a bit complex. For FATO number one, nice and simple, it's aligned with the north-south flight paths, and it's going to allow us to either key in a clearway or key in a approach climb out surface. FATOs three and four are quite similar in the sense that those singular flight paths, either in or out or both, again, have that nice uh, normal squaring off process there to allow us to attach the necessary OLS. What happens with FATO number two, though, is essentially we put the circumscribed square down through the entire arc of that sector. Of course, a circular pattern emerges, and then that too will result in a fairly complex looking approach climb out surface or even a clearway. Again, the more flexibility you want in the operation of your particular Verdi port, unfortunately, it lends itself to creating more complexity. But those are decisions that we want Verdi port proponents to make within their operating environment and with respect to the aircraft that may be using their Verdi ports. In the next situation, let's have a look at vertical procedures. Now, this particular Verdi port that we'll look at here only has vertical procedures. You can have a combination of both. If you do, you will have to apply both sets of specifications. As stated before, we've assumed that a vertical procedure goes straight up from the FATO to whatever height is specified by either the aircraft capability or this particular operator. The FATO protection area on the ground is simply the reference circle centered on the center of the FATO. Pretty simple. As the aircraft climbs and reaches its point where it wants to start its flight, either horizontal flight or perhaps an approach climb out, we've essentially introduced a virtual FATO suspended just below this surface. The virtual FATO itself has a reference circle. It helps us to define the specifications. 
and becomes a circumscribed square again so that we can key it into either the approach climb out surface or a clearway. You'll note that it gets bigger, or at least in this image, it is bigger. And it does get bigger the higher you go. It may seem like an arbitrary number, and in some cases it sort of is an arbitrary number, but we have specified that this rate of increase is one design D per 100 feet. There's a certain geometric reason why we picked that ratio, which I'll get to in a couple of slides. But again, it's based on the assumption that as the aircraft climbs, it will be less able to maintain its desired position above the center of the FATO. So we're giving it more clearance as it climbs into the air. If there is data that becomes available as aircraft are tested and this data is shared or definitely when uh, aircraft are operating in the real world, that says that this uh, rate of increase is excessive, by all means we will review and bring it in line with actual practice and actual safety margins in the industry. The final piece of the puzzle in this particular case is the OFV. So this is the obstacle free volume. If you're familiar with Verdi port specifications, you will have heard that term before. We have 100% stolen it from EASA, but we've actually applied it in a little bit of a different way. In our particular application here, it is a truncated cone. It is essentially the portion of a cone that joins the reference circle on the ground to the reference circle within the vertical procedure surface or that virtual FATO. Just to give you a three-dimensional view of what this may look like. I want to acknowledge the European OFV and point out a few differences because it, what they accommodate within their specifications, we didn't necessarily want to lose. We've just applied it in a slightly different way. Apologies if you're familiar with it, but I'll just quickly describe the European OFV. It is essentially a safety buffer around a defined airspace within which the VTOL capable aircraft operates. It has a longitudinal dimension, both back and front, that may be different to the lateral dimension. And you can see in that specification that they are acknowledging a certain amount of horizontal movement or momentum associated with either the start or the end of a vertical procedure. And this is something that we definitely didn't want to lose, but at least within the protection of a vertical procedure, this is how we've established the OFV. For the next step, looking at this horizontal aspect of maneuvers around the FATO or above the FATO, this diagram here again from Europe was something essential to how we constructed our own OLS. We actually really enjoyed looking at and pulling apart this diagram. So I thank our colleagues from Europe for preparing it and sharing it. Our focus was often drawn to this area at the end of the red arrow. It's a certain portion of lateral space that allows the aircraft to get up to the takeoff safety speed. That's what VTOS means. Depending on the scenario, both in terms of the vertiport, its elevation, and the aircraft requirements, different flight profiles may be required if the aircraft suffers a critical failure at the worst possible time. While we mulled over what this surface was and what we could call it, it finally hit us. And um, if you're looking at this picture and it's already hit you, you're doing a lot better than we did. But this is essentially a clearway serves exactly the same purpose as a conventional runway clearway. It's extra area off the end of the maneuvering area that allows the aircraft after a critical failure to get up to, not necessarily to take off safety speed in that circumstance, but at least have enough speed to conduct a safe climb out. Therefore, what we've implemented in our specifications are clearways horizontal areas that allow for clearance about this horizontal maneuver. 
Now, it may still have a vertical portion, as you saw in the previous slide. There may be a certain amount of letdown required by the aircraft to achieve that forward momentum. But this is essentially the virtual ground level, similar to the virtual runway idea that we've already discussed. But there's one aspect that I haven't included in the drawing, and the virtual runway idea might belie, and that is that this surface is about lateral clearance about the flight path. So if the flight path has a turn in it, so too does the clearway. This is essentially providing a clearance area for any type of horizontal maneuver. And I've got an example in a couple of slides coming up. It is also not just for takeoff. So in that previous slide, we're talking about a climb out after a critical failure in the departure maneuver. It can also serve an aircraft trying to wash off momentum on approach before entering its vertical maneuver. Or it could be about repositioning the aircraft within the airspace, not as an air taxi, but at a speed required to achieve a takeoff at the end of it or maintain safe flight following a critical failure at any point during that maneuver. The width of this surface is essentially defined by the origin it comes from. So whether that's the FATO protection area on the ground or the vertical procedure surface, that will essentially key in one to one and provide that lateral clearance. Moving into the more traditional surfaces, we define an approach slash climb out surface. It is just one surface. The language in heliport standards gets a little bit confusing about whether it's a takeoff and or an approach surface. We've just put that to side and we call it consistency, the approach climb out surface. From above, they look the same anyway. For our definitions here, the inner edge, that initial point, is the width set by the FPA, the VPS or the clearway. Whatever surface it attaches to, defines the inner edge. The rate of divergence, exactly the same as the heliport standards, 10% by day, 15% by night. And they both reach a final width, seven times design D for day and 10 times design D for night. These are familiar specifications. It ends when it reaches 152 meters above the FATO or 500 feet. Now, the reason we've defined the outer edge height and not the length of this surface is because we do not define the slope. The slope of this surface is either going to be defined by the obstacle environment or perhaps even the noise environment, or it may be defined by the aircraft capabilities. In either case, the other is going to lim limit the impact on the environment or on the aircraft. In addition to not defining a slope, we also permit combinations of slopes. So if there's multiple stage arrivals or multiple stage departures, that can be accommodated within our specifications. Although we have one limitation on that, the area within the divergent portion of the approach climb out surface needs to be consistent. And it needs that for geometric reasons, so to tie into our, uh, our transitional surface. Eagle-eyed people may also note that we don't have any of the curved flight path limitations that exist in heliport specifications. And the reason for that is we don't know exactly how these op aircraft will necessarily operate. So if the aircraft is capable of multiple turns during its approach, then we're happy to accommodate that. Again, everything is based on the flight path. Just coming back to the maximum height and to probably turn back to the discussion about the arbitrary number associated with the VPS dimension. If we take again our standards to the extreme, if we consider a vertical procedure up to the maximum height of 152 metres, and I'm not sure any aircraft or operator is looking to conduct such a manoeuvre, but what if? At that height, the VPS becomes seven times design D, which is exactly the divergence of the approach climb out in the daytime situation. 
at that scenario as well, there'll be no approach climb out surface requirement because you're already at that 500 feet and so essentially can move straight into en route considerations. The final surface, our transitional surfaces, I like to think of this as where all our flexibility chickens came home to roost. All the allowances we made for vertical procedures, the slope of the approach climb out surface made it very hard to think about specifications for the transitional surface in the traditional sense. What would the relationship be with the variable approach surface? And that's why we introduced the limitation on the slope within that divergent area, because in the end, the solution came to us through a logical understanding of what this surface was for. To define the transitional surface as essentially you meet at that divergence point or that max width point of the approach climb out surface, draw the upper edges parallel to your flight path, extend them to the end of the VPS or the FATO protection area, and then join the bottom edge to the top edge. What this ends up doing in terms of obstacle clearance is that at any height during the approach that an aircraft decides to break off the approach and maintain straight and level flight, they will continue to be protected laterally by the same dimensions of the approach surface that they were just on. So logically speaking, and the reasons why we built all these things together, we provide a consistent clearance to the aircraft as it is maintaining that approach. Here's OLS to potentially one extreme. For some reason, a departure, let's say, to the west in this diagram here is not possible. Could be obstacles, could be environmental, could be noise. But the VertiPort operator would prefer the aircraft to take off to the north or to approach from the north in that particular circumstance. To the east, it's not too much of a problem. To get from the vertical procedure to that approach climb out surface, there is a clearway. It has a 90 degree bend halfway through and then a little bit more room to reach a forward momentum required to achieve that climb out. All the other things you can do with these specifications can get quite interesting. Uh, the team and I explored many different variations and combinations of vertical procedures, sector arrivals, a whole bunch of different ways of looking at it. And some of the diagrams got quite complex. And rather than just throw all these options at you, I think this will take time to be able to build an appreciation of the flexibility of these specifications and how they might be applied in the future. Thank you very much for your attention so far. We'll definitely get into our Q&A session in the moment. In fact, I think Sarah will open the chat just while I touch on a little bit of a summary and a few more things associated with housekeeping. Just to rehash what we've done today, we've looked through the components of the obstacle limitation surfaces for Verdi ports. We discussed the rationale behind the development of those specifications and gone through some of the key characteristics and parameters. We've looked at things like inner edges, divergence, reference circles, circumscribed squares, the VPS and the OFE. Just in terms of housekeeping, let me just remind you that we have one more webinar in this particular series to go. It's in two weeks and we'll be discussing visual aids. That'll be with Liam and I. If there are any airport operators in the room that are members or interested in the AAA, we are going to do a webinar just a week after that with them. It will be very similar to the first webinar in this series, but with more of an airport operator flavor involved. And then finally, if you're going to the Avalon Air Show, I'll be attending and I'll be manning the Kazakhstan on the 28th of Feb and the 1st of March. If you want to come along and talk Verdi ports, I'd more than happy to accommodate you. If you want to talk aerodrome standards, I'll happy, happily accommodate you as well. And finally, we do very much want your formal feedback associated with the specifications that we've designed and put out to draft. We appreciated all the 
informal feedback and even the 13 people that have already submitted their formal feedback. If you want to hold out on submitting that feedback until you've seen the final webinar, so you've had more of a chance to digest this webinar and the other material, that's okay. It will be open until the end of March. So please feel free to take your time. Again, if you've got a QR code scanner, that will take you to our consultation hub. Scroll down. Actually, I think that one will take you direct to this particular consultation. But if you get to the main page, scroll down a little bit. We've got a few open consultations at the moment. Look for the diagram of the VertiPort or advisory circular 139 Victor. And then follow the survey process there to provide your feedback. But let's get to some questions. I think the chat is already open. Thank you very much for your attention so far. And uh, if you have a question, please feel free to enter it into the chat and uh, we will try and address it as much as possible. Uh, we've got Kat first, uh, who's asking, would performance data be needed to prove compatibility to use 90 degree flight path angle? I ask because FAA has stricter radius requirements. Yes, the, the radius requirements, uh, I may be wrong, but there are definitely radius requirements in the heliport specifications, and I would hazard a guess that the EB has replicated those. Um, in terms of regulations, uh, this is all advisory material at this stage. For any VertiPort proponent at the moment, my general advice just as a, an aviation safety person, is that proving capability, proving sufficiency of all these requirements to yourself will be a very important aspect of your initial investigations of your own VertiPort environment. And therefore that will put you in good stead for how you get those um, specifications or your particular designs either approved, if that's the method that gets used, in Australia or another jurisdiction, whether it's by CASA or a local council. All those aspects, if you satisfy yourself of those requirements, if you prove it to yourself, then you're likely to be able to meet anybody else's requirements, especially if they're based on these specifications. Um, excuse me, I can't read your name, unfortunately, but uh, the next question uh, is regards to our strategic roadmap. That's our AAM and RPAS roadmap. Uh, this draft, uh, I'll read the question. Sorry, I'm, I'm working on the fly here. I think the draft AC has been released. Yes, this is our advisory circular. It's the first of many advisory circulars that will come out from CASA um, or, or potentially standards and regulations as well, depending on which aspect of the industry. At least in the VertiPort space, we have introduced this advisory circular first. We'll be looking at operations, and other aspects of uh, VertiPort, the VertiPort life cycle in the very near future. Um, in terms of application of the standard, uh, as I've said, this is an advisory document. We will be exploring and, and there was more detail in the first webinar about what the regulatory environment will be, but we're gonna do that in consultation with our Aviation Safety Advisory Panel and a technical working group that's going to get stood up in the coming weeks. So the regulatory structure around these specifications is very much a discussion point as we move into the next phase of this development. Excuse me, I just want to cover off on any aspect of your question. Um, in terms of ICAO annexes, uh, Mr. Joe Hain is our representative to the VertiPort Design subgroup. That subgroup has not yet met. This is an ICAO subgroup. Um, it works under the Heliport Design Working Group. Its first meeting uh, is due in April, I think, um, in which case that is the start of the discussion. Incorporation into any annex is going to take uh, a much longer time. Um, I see the final bit of your point here is with respect to using the heliport standards um, in Annex 14 Volume 2. They were definitely a reference point uh, for us in developing that, but there is a lot more um, understanding of the capabilities of, of helicopters. There's a lot of existing standards around how they operate and what their critical failure requirements are. And so 
we didn't necessarily adopt everything associated with uh, heliport standards and again we talk about that a little bit more in the first webinar you're welcome to to go back and have a look at that if you didn't already see it uh, richard's question here is do the ols spatial envelopes consider and provide additional clearance to limit wind tunnel and turbulence effects from urban canyons particularly an inner urban area with tall buildings it's been a lot of great discussion online over the last week about these effects associated with wind around buildings and the short answer to that question is no and the reason how we get around that is firstly this is about obstacle clearance but those considerations will impact the flight path and as i mentioned before the pieces of the puzzle that's one i didn't mention the definition of a flight path to and from the Verde port should definitely consider wind tunneling or other turbulence around buildings and we would expect the aircraft operator to make those considerations in defining their Verde port flight path and then the Verde port operator would work with them to examine that from a clearance point of view i hope that gets to the essence of your question richard uh yusuf uh, with respect to flexibility of mixed operations are utilized with normal helicopters. Um, at least within Australia, currently, both the heliport specifications and these specifications are advisory material. The regulatory basis, at least for helicopters, still exists under the general part 91 requirement that an aircraft operator is satisfied with the safety of the, uh, the helicopter landing site that they're operating to and from. Uh, so if those requirements are still met, then essentially both types of operations can occur. Um, we wouldn't necessarily recommend that these specifications are also just applied to helicopters without, of course, them undertaking that analysis to satisfy themselves in accordance with the regulations in Part 91. Uh, Ken has mentioned that the FAA doesn't allow approach departure surfaces over aircraft parking or the terminal. Does CASA allow both? Um, by the terms of the specifications we've defined, we would if they were clear. So if they were not obstacles, if they were below the relevant obstacle limitation surfaces, there's no uh, prohibition, uh, prohibition against doing that. Uh, but it is a good point that we may have to review and look at uh, specific details related to that particular concept. So thanks for the uh, question, Ken. Uh, Simon, your question is, will the OLS requirements be a single type for either instrument or non-instrument approaches? Will operators have to register a Verdi port? What is going to happen when everyone owns a flying car at their home? Uh, very easy questions to answer Simon. Um, no consideration of instrument approaches at this stage. As I mentioned earlier, this AC is predicated on pilot on board flight in visual conditions. What instrument approaches look like for the AAM industry is very much open to debate, I believe, and uh, we'll be all watching that discussion as it unfolds. Uh, registration of a Verdi port or even certification, if I can take your question one step further, is a question we'll examine with the technical working group under the ASAP. So that's one of the first questions we want to tackle about will there be a pathway to certification or registration? What will the minimum requirement be, if any? And um, I know you're local and you're probably very interested in being involved in that and would welcome your input. Uh, through that uh, mechanism. And what is going to happen when everyone owns a flying car? Um, I don't know, but I'm sort of curious to see. But uh, I think we're a ways from that and we will follow that process as we get closer to anything like that occurring. Thanks, Simon. Uh, Behram has asked uh, about autonomous flying vehicle requirements. Would they have similar OLS envelopes? Uh, is there a risk factor differentiating both? Um, I think with respect to autonomous uh, vehicles, of course, that challenges our assumption, the assumption associated with flight paths with respect to visual reference to the ground and drift about the intended flight path. Um, we could not apply that necessarily, that same assumption. Um, and I think that assumption also starts to weaken 
when we deal with perhaps somewhere in the middle, piloted but assisted piloted, or as Simon touched on, instrument approach procedures. This environment uh, is very open, I think, with respect to the operating modes that may occur. And at least at this stage, we've tried to define the environment that we've applied or built these specifications on so that as the real environment opens up, we know when we have to start revisiting these concepts. So the risk factor associated is unknown and much like every webinar we've held, I will reiterate, we would love some data. So if any manufacturers out there willing to start sharing their uh, testing data of what the capabilities of their aircraft are, especially autonomous ones as well, uh, we'd be very interested. Um, Yusuf has asked about CNS requirements. Uh, so for those that don't know, that's communication, navigation and surveillance requirements. We are mainly focused on the aerodrome style infrastructure at this stage. Uh, we have a standards officer, hopefully coming online within CASA, uh, recruitment is being finalised in the coming weeks. Part of their job will be to examine those CNS requirements in the vicinity of Verdi ports, potentially above Verdi ports. So that's very much something that's going to be explored within CASA and within our stakeholders as well. Uh, Yasushi has asked about flight procedure design. Uh, actually, I'm not sure you're even asking a question. Uh, he's putting forward that uh, we're still not sure what the procedures will look like. I, I agree with that. Um, there will need to be consistency between OLS and flight procedure design. I agree with that 100%. And how do we connect flight procedure design and OLS? Um, I might cut to the chase a little bit uh, with respect to a activities that are broader than VertiPort uh, design at the moment, but uh, this team, um, or at least Joe and I, are very much exploring in our other parts of our jobs, the impact of the work of the OLS task force and the changes coming to Annex 14 for conventional aerodromes. And I dare say Yasushi is familiar with the work there that is, I think, aligning OLS and flight procedure design much more with the uh, new dimensions of what they call the obstacle evaluation surfaces. So we're very much uh, familiar with that work and any building on that work that we can also apply to Verdi ports we're also interested in. Uh, William has put in here, uh, if aircraft are allowed underneath the OLS and buildings, etc. Going back to the earlier question, what about ground transport vehicles, cars, trains? Um, uh, the same answer would apply. At this stage, we hadn't considered it. We've just considered the presence of an obstacle, regardless of what that obstacle is. I do like the addition of plumes uh, coming out of particular trains um, and plume rise generally. Um, that's something we'll definitely bring into the next iteration of this advisory circular. I'm sure Joe's already writing it down now. So thank you, William, for bringing up that concept and for challenging aspects of these specifications already. Um, again, apologies, uh, one of our East Asian uh, attendees, um, I can't read your name, but uh, you've asked to, we can confirm the terminal height of the approach climb out surface, or sorry, more the height of the VPS, uh, that will be based on the aircraft flight path requirement. Again, the vertical portion of their flight path, they will enter into the VPS environment, essentially their virtual FATO. The height of that can essentially be the bottom of the aircraft in that hover mode. Um, and then it will be as high as required for that particular procedure. As I said before, if the procedure goes to 152 metres, a 500 foot vertical climb, um, then there is no requirement for the approach climb out surface after that because they've already essentially met that or they're already in that in en route airspace environment. Uh, Kat has asked a question about interpreting the clearway um, there's no clearance requirement beyond the protection area at ground level. Uh, if the clearway is at ground level, if there is a straight 
virtual runway, let's say, the aircraft is not on the ground, then that would be there. The clearway doesn't necessarily need to be elevated. It does continue to protect the aircraft that may be in a low hover state or at least a low flight state at that area. Um, and also, if the uh, FATO protection area abuts the approach climb out surface, then of course, depending on the angle of that surface, there'll be pretty limited development uh, underneath that surface for potentially 100 or 200 metres, again, depending on the slope. Uh, Alexandra has mentioned, does it provide solutions? This is the new advisory circular for high vertiports in terms of infrastructure, visual aids and fire prevention. Um, <clears throat> for elevated vertiports, which I think is the, the question you're asking, Alexandra, um, we've actually simplified the standards. There are there's actually only one requirement for an elevated vertiport, and it's actually a limitation on an elevated vertiport, and that's to ensure that any safety devices at the surface edge do not infringe the FATO or the FATO protection area. Um, otherwise, we have no additional or different infrastructure requirements for a vertiport that exists on top of a building versus one that exists in a paddock. Again, Visual aids, uh, uh, there's no distinction between the types of vertiports in that environment. We'll talk more about that in two weeks, but as a bit of a teaser, I think we've approached visual aids from a very outcome based point of view. And a big part of that was the idea if there are multiple vertiports in a city environment, then the requirements for the outputs of those lights are going to vary considerably to a vertiport that is out at an aerodrome, which is relatively dark environment. Fire prevention, though, if I can get to the last point of your question there, is something that we're avoiding at the moment because we want to talk to people responsible for building code requirements and fire uh, response generally, especially in an urban environment as well. So we haven't yet touched that, although we do recognise that there's been um, moves at ICAO level to look at fire response to uh, lithium batteries. There's been a lot of work in the heliport space with respect to uh, fire response. So we'll definitely be looking at that, but it's a discussion we want to have with colleagues in those other government and planning areas. And that could be the end. That is one hour. I want to thank again everybody for their attention, for their attendance. Um, if you do have any follow-up questions, please feel free to contact us through the CASA Verdiport email address. Um, and uh, please get your feedback into the consultation hub once you're comfortable with your understanding of it. But I appreciate even a couple of the questions today, floating concepts that uh, we haven't necessarily considered. So thank you very much for your feedback uh, already.